usually have the initials of the person. Oh, okay. Now, I, uh, I now the, early, the earlier ones, ones, yeah, the earlier ones will have the name, uh, usually the name and a like date. Okay. Uh, and as time progresses, it goes down to just the initials. My focus is old burying grounds, not so much as cemeteries. There is a big difference between the two. Old burying grounds are pre-1800, cemeteries are post-1800. Old burying grounds, you lived, you died, you had a right to be buried. End of story. A cemetery comes along later. It's when you're pre-planning, you know, people are organized in family plots, you pay for it ahead of time, and it's money. Okay, the, in an old burying ground, the only money that was related to anything is perhaps a grave digger would be paid to dig the grave. And if it was for a pauper or someone new in town that no one knew, someone else with money usually took care of that, that price. So that wasn't an issue. Again, like I said, having a gravestone, another whole issue. People never got, and again, I'm talking pretty much pre-1800, nobody ever got a gravestone the year they died. Okay, it was a process, a process you have to go back, and I keep reminding people of this. If you're going to talk about the 1700s, the 1600s, then put yourself back in that time. As far as tablestones in Old South Cemetery when we get down there, this is, I think, the only one. There might be one or two, but I, this is the only one in the old section. It's also the only sandstone that seems to be in that cemetery, not a local mixed stone, but a pure sandstone. So this very well may have come up from the Stancliffe Quarry or from somewhere, you know, on the river. So it's for, your, it's for Ebenezer Williams, first pastor of the church. And this is just briefly what it says on it. You have a good connection with Massachusetts, especially especially where Connecticut and Springfield overlapped for some time. A lot of our earliest carvers, again, Mr. Griswold, who this is his work, they worked from that area and then gradually came down to work into Connecticut, the Windsor area in Connecticut and so forth. But basically what I want to show you here is that in the Puritan times, to have any kind of artistic value, was a, um, a vanity, considered vanity, and the Puritans did not do that. So all of your earliest stones are pretty much just what I call a primitive. They don't have any artwork on them. Basically, your story is there, very simply printed. This is actually a pretty, pretty adorned stone. It's got a lot on it, and this one's <coughs> up in Springfield. But your early ones would be very plain. And don't forget, if you find mistakes on stones, you're working like this on that stone as you go along. A lot of your carvers and apprentices were illiterate. They were only copying what someone gave them to copy. This is coming down into Connecticut. This is <clears throat> Joseph Johnson. He started up in Hadley, Mass, came down this way. His brothers ended up owning the Johnson Quarry, which is what took over the Portland Quarry after the Stancliffs. But for some reason, he seemed to hang on his own and work with other carvers. So the names get very, very confusing. We also have a John Johnson in Durham, who, who supposedly is not related to this Johnson family either. But he also became a carver. In the 1750s here, mid-1700s, early 1700s, what we have more so in Connecticut than Massachusetts and Rhode Island. Massachusetts and Rhode Island, they started earlier. You've got more skulls, you've got slate stones. We don't have that in Connecticut. Any slates that I do find in Connecticut with skulls on them pretty much go right back to a carver that came from Rhode Island, Massachusetts, which also means that that family that paid for it had the connection back in Massachusetts and Rhode Island. I call it reverse genealogy because I lived in Providence, Rhode Island, but my family moved to Hartford. So if somebody dies, well, it's up to me to get the gravestone, pay for it, and have it sent to the grave. Got it? So that's how you, you understand a lot of that. So what we have is something that is reminiscent of the face, the soul of the person, wings, hopefully the soul will be ascending to heaven, and a crown or something on top of the head that represents the crown of righteousness. 
That means if you have been a good Christian, your pathway to heaven is already paved for you. It's a good song. Right? Similar here, but it's a little bit later. And this is the Mannings, and you can see you've got the wings, the face, the crown gets to be more of a fancy hairdo now, but you get other design works in there. And I've got more to show you on them, and you'll see just how fancy they get as time goes on. So when looking at old burying grounds, again, like I was mentioning before, things were moved. Very seldom are you seeing now what was. Different stones have, have deteriorated, been moved around. Uh, look at all this wide area. People were not laid out in straight rows. That's all for your lawnmowers. The early lawnmowers being four-footed little fuzzy guys, you know, sheep. and They didn't care about straight rows. Didn't matter to them. But this is because of modern-day lawnmowers that we all, at, at this most we started late 1800s, putting everybody in straight rows, grouping things together as well as they could. Often you'll find headstones, footstones, and a footstone will be in a row with headstones. I mean, what can I say? You just have to have an open mind when you're trying to figure these things out in today's world. Now, in a place like this, this one appears to have a lot of footstones missing. That happens in many, many yards. They were thought of as nuisance stones to the lawnmower, so it's throw them away, get rid of them, or use them for other things. These that are on the sharp angles would be the first ones you'd want to reset because the sharper that angle, the more, especially come towards winter, you're going to get a snap right above ground level when the freeze, the water freezes and it hardens against that stone. Now here's a burying ground that, I, again, I've spent a lot of time in. This one appears to be pretty natural and pretty correct, has not been rearranged that much. But basically what you see here, footstones, headstones, footstone, headstones, footstone, headstones. Things are pretty much in their natural order. This is east, so they're all facing the right direction, and this is also the entrance to the cemetery. But what's interesting is you see these groupings of family members. You don't see 15, 18 Bentons in a row. If you see that, and especially if the dates are jumping like 60, 80 years apart, that's another clue that that cemetery or whatever you're looking at has been realigned. That's a favorite thing that people would do back in the turn of the century when they cleaned up old burying grounds, just put all the smiths together, put all the grounds together, so on and so forth. So just be cautious of that. Okay, here you are at Old South again. Now, again, I don't, we don't have all our footstones. This is a pair here, I believe. Very difficult to try to pair some of these off because the distance isn't always working for it. Pretty much you want to grid things in your mind as from the headstone, two feet to the next row for the footstone, six feet to the next headstone, basically, if you were going to map it out. You'd have about two feet between rows or between sections of other burials. Unfortunately, the weathering and because they haven't been, well, nobody's been cleaning these stones. This is a tough yard. These, these are really all hard to read. I have my next couple of pictures will show you some that we rediscovered. But this to me, as you go into that cemetery and about a third of the way up on your right, seems to be the clutter of old stones. So I'm assuming this is perhaps where the burying ground started and it branched out into a cemetery, obviously in the back and to the left, obviously. The other thing that's very difficult about this cemetery is it's not going east to west, which really puzzles me. It's more of a, a northeast direction. Now, we've discussed that with a couple, couple of the local people. My only excuse for that is the sun rises. Now, if you look where the sun rises now as to where the sun rises in April, you've got a lot of space. Okay? It's still on the east direction, but not as direct. Perhaps the first burial aligned more with that. I can't say. I don't know. But it is interesting that this one does not seem to follow that pattern. So your first, the first burying ground was two acres that was given by Philemon Chandler. Now, why it's called the Sabin Cemetery, I haven't had time to figure that out yet. Perhaps our local historians can explain that to us. I think there definitely was a connection between the Chandler and the Sabin family. 
It seems all I could find was there were there were two sons named Savin. Um, I'm trying to do this from memory, so please forgive me if I get this wrong. I don't know if it was Philemon or not, but I think it was. Had 20 children. Okay? It's a lot of kids. I'm assuming more than one wife. So perhaps his first wife was a Savin, and that's where those first two Savin names are coming from. Now, things like this. This is a Sexton's record I found at the library. These are for pauper's graves with no stones. God knows where this cemetery even exists. It's in Saybrook somewhere, but it's probably just built on now, totally gone. But the interesting thing here is if you do genealogy, it was important in the early days to name your son after either your father-in-law on either side to try to bring that name forward. So look what this family went through trying to get a son named Daniel, which was probably her father that they were trying to repeat. Four Daniels, and not one lived more than, I guess, a few months. God bless. Now, this is what I found in one of my older books on Abington, which I shared with Donna. But also to let you know that this is, this is in your Abington Cemetery. Often you'll find things listed like this. And not only are we getting information of who owned Palm, and that we had a couple of mulatto people there, even though it's spelled mulatto. All right? And we have an Indian. So if we have stones for these people, those are direct contacts to stories we can make. Again, odd things to find which are very interesting. Jesse Gay was killed by the splitting of a pistol. I'm not sure what that means. Maybe it blew up when he was using it. No, that's, yeah. But you find interesting tidbits of history by going through old records, not just looking what someone's indexed online. So again, like I said, stones move around, things change. Both of these happen to be in Coventry. Coventry was one of those towns that when they did work in, again, the turn of the century, 1900, about give or take, footstones were nuisance stones. They removed them from all their cemeteries. They used them to pave one cemetery, and we've, we've removed them all and put them back where they belong. Paved the, the driveway small burial ground because obviously the water table was higher and the wheels to the carriage were getting stuck in the mud. So there was a reason for why they did it, but unfortunately what they also did, these are all footstones, they broke off the curved tops to make rectangular slabs out of them. What can I say? So this is what it looks like when you go into the hail yard. The uh, retaining wall as you drive up is paved with these guys. This is another one where the, the lady had a marble, nice marble stone. So at some point in, in history, the family decided, oh, now that marble is the in thing to do, let's give so-and-so a nice marble stone and get rid of this old crappy one. There's nothing wrong with that old crappy stone. The group in Coventry, what we did was we, I found this stone on the wall, picked it up, and sure enough, it was her gravestone. So we did reinstall it and put it back next to the replicated stone, which is how it should be. You should never get rid of the original stone. If you're going to replicate it or do something else, it should be right next to the original. You don't, it, it's against the law to discard original gravestone. Primitive stones are my thing because that's the earliest history and that's what I want to get my hands on. So this is Woodstock. This is a before and an after, and I only cleaned with water. I don't use D2 in some cases, the stuff I do, but my basic work is just with water because this can be done with water. Why am I spending the money? And here we go again, the before, the after. All right, and it's a carver that we do know. It's a local carver. This one's, I believe, is out in Chaplin. But you couldn't read this. And on a lot of lists, I mean, how many of you are familiar with the hail list? Okay, so you know what I'm talking about is the Hale List, which was done in, 19, in the 1930s, basically as a, as a WPA project for veterans to make sure veterans got graves. But as it went, he collected, like I said, <laughs> lots of information from towns about everybody buried in all the different cemeteries. So if, if at that time, if the stone looked like this, someone may not have been able to transcribe it, it may not be on that list. And I'm always trying to compare to make sure. 
on the other hand, you may find stones on that list that now we don't, we don't have, that they deteriorated. Okay, so that's another important thing to acknowledge. Um, the ones I'm working on in Old South over here, I have found a couple of primitive stones that weren't on either list because people couldn't read them, so they were ignored. Marble stones, your D2 really works nicely on the marble. Um, you just want to do it carefully, but this is the difference you can make when you're using it. The yellow on this stone is because it's like a bioproduct that is like a waste that's attacking that lichen, so it's making that color come out. And then you let it sit and do its work for a while, and then rinse it out, scrub it with water, nice and foamy is what I like to do, and then rinse it. And this is all in one day's work. Okay. The only th problem I get into with D2, and it's not a problem of D2, a lot of people feel differently. Sometimes with your marble, after the sun beats on it for a week or so, you, it will start to be bright white. I have an issue as a historian with something 200 years old looking bright white. Okay, just my personal opinion. Now, shaving cream chalk, all those wonderful things that were used way back when. People have asked me recently about rubbing. If you know what you're doing, yes, you could still do a rubbing. It's not illegal. Because I live in the Connecticut Valley and we have so many sandstones, and because sandstones get a crust on the outside and go hollow on the inside, if you were to put pressure on that, you would right into it, which is most of the time what lawnmowers do. Lawnmowers come up against it, hit it, and blows your whole stone apart. Um, so we don't really push for rubbings whatsoever. Slate stones do rubbings very nicely. What we do use, and like again, I don't know if the sun's going to work with us today, is um, I teach people to use a mirror. If, if you're trying to just read stones and, and document things, you can even use a small hand mirror. I just worked with a group this, this summer that I didn't have my mirror with me, but you know, everybody's got a cell phone, it seems now, that has a battery light on it. Not as good as a mirror. A mirror is the best to use, but even maybe that will help shadow and cast lighting so that you can see. You just want to use it at a right angle against the stone. Never dead on. Right angle so you get that shadowing. So these are ones that were hard to read. Worn marble is definitely hard to read. and It's amazing when you put a mirror on it. This row of stones. Now I had said if it was a lot of family members in a row. This one is contrary to what I'm telling you because these are all number one by the same carver. So they may have been ordered at the same time even, who knows? I don't think the years are that far apart. And again, because the years are not that far apart, it would make sense to me that maybe they were all done at the same time. Okay, so that is a possibility for these guys. All right, these are some of the, the primitive ones out there that I did try to clean and try to figure out stories on. This is your before, this is your after. We did not have a lot of sun the day I was out there, so... The mirror was not helping me that much, but just to show you what you can come up with. Now, I pieced together enough information on what I could read. It's the son of Zechariah and Abigail. Now, in one of the records, I think it was must have been Hale, it shows an Abigail, and I think it's this one. I don't think it's Abigail at all. So, and then you have, Ab Ab however you spell this name, spelled differently in Hale, and it says 1775, age five years. Well, when I was working on this, I found a five, which made sense to me. But I'm not sure the 1745 is making sense to me. I can't read it clear enough. But I just want to show you the mysteries and the work you can do on these things. Now, Moses. There are two Moseses listed in Hale, both with the date of 1773, one age seven, one age four. This particular one, I do find the age four on uh, The one next to it, I find the age four on it. This one, I couldn't find the seven. But it sure looks very clear to me right here that it's saying 1730, not 1773. But, the, I mean, there's a zero here. I'm not, not sure about this one, you know. But that's another one to be deciphered and be worked on, you know. And his is another, again, a very primitive one. This one did not show up on the Hale list, and yet here we can find it today and try to decipher it as best we can. Now, I get a, I get a Josiah out of it. I get an I, not, not a, a U out of it. But either way, it just could be how the stone is worn. 
but again, a very primitive stone, very, very primitive. But it does say down here, son of E.G. I don't know that you can see that from there. So that tells me it's probably this stone. Now, even with your very good qualified carvers, you may run into something like this. Now, that does not mean that the carver made a mistake. Pretty much, I think that means that for some reason, this was a leftover stone, maybe not picked up, paid for, who knows, but it was still in the shop, and I hope for a cheaper price, somebody was able to get their information on here and buy the stone. Now, so it's changed the name, all the basic information stayed the same, change the date, change the age, change that last year. Now, if these are pretty obvious, but this is what you sometimes have to look for. Very, very hard if you can make it out. But where I put these circles, you can see where it's been sanded down and buffed out and changed. All right, these are some primitives that I'm so happy to find. Um, this one is for Josiah, another Josiah Chandler. Not on the list. And this is not December, it's deceased. And again, the J is just a straight up and down line here. But it's July, and I believe it's July 7th and 1724, which makes him one of the earliest burials there. And not on a hail list. And I find that interesting because it doesn't look that bad there. That's not clean. That's just how it looks. Now, this one really got my attention, and it was really a doozy. But Joseph Kraft, and he died, and this is how, how much I've been able to transcribe, but Hale does show a Captain Joseph Kraft that died the 23rd, so maybe that's what the two is matching up to, 1754, which may be what the 7-5 is, but I didn't get anything with the 60 years, so I'm not sure I've got it matched up exactly yet. But to me, these are, these, these are just primitive. Somebody didn't have the money, somebody locally tried to make this stone. This has always been one of my favorites in this yard. I've had this picture for like 30 years. And I just want to show you again where the carvers and how the locality times have run. Now, Peter Chandler, if you see, there's, he's got decorations on the corner, decorations on the corner. The shape of the stone is rather rough, not really honed down, and very, very unique, very different, very, very different. Now, and I also want to point out this. So here we have with these two corners, die we must, we are but dust. Okay, a little bit of a rhyme. And here you have the 1732 OY33. Okay. That's old year 33. If you see a slash, that would be the two and then a three, it's, it's, it's referencing old year and new year. Now this, I think, is the same carver or from the same shop. See how the shape is different and it's very rough? This particular one is for Ebenezer Holmes, 1721. Chandler, 1703. These two are in Woodstock, but close enough. I think whoever the carver is, he may be related to the Holmes family. We do have some carvers. It seems to be Holmes did some primitive stones. I haven't been able to prove it out yet, but I think that's probably who did these early stones. This I am so proud of, and I just want to let you know, I've done all the research I can to figure this one out. Joseph Griffin was the first buried in this yard. And look at what Michael and Keegan and them found the first day we were out there. JG723. So I think we got it. We, we have to look for the headstone now. We only have the footstone. But oh my God, the first buried. I'm Keegan Day. I'm, uh, I work with uh, Rediscovering History, which uh, Ruthie mentioned, where we actually do a, a gravestone preservation, resetting the stones, cleaning, etc. Uh, I, in particular, study the carvers of the uh, gravestones and areas as well. But I made a presentation here, and this is about the different carvers that are actually represented in uh, the Saban Burying Ground. And these are just, just a few examples of just the different designs. And you can see there's a similar theme of a soul, but there's a lot of different ways to uh, create and interpret that theme. The first uh, carver I'd like to talk about is Richard Kimball, who actually was a Pomfret native. 
and uh, he's represented at Sabin with, I believe, almost 50 different stones, examples of the work. He carved from the 1750s to the 1780s, and he ended up moving actually to New York. And he carved, what's interesting about his styles is, there's, you can't find a lot of very clear attributes to where his design work came from. Even in, if you look around the cemetery, there's most of the stones, his designs he didn't really copy, from what I can tell, no obvious influences. He had a very, quite a uh, square jaw cherubim, as you can see here. Uh, these, uh, he had these kind of almost Egyptian looking eyes. This is a uh, spiral rosette, which is actually a very common symbol used in New England uh, gravestones, not just in Connecticut, but New Jersey, Massachusetts, etc. So that he might have, he probably copped off something else. But of course, most of the carvers in the period were taking designs from one another, and uh, that's just that was just a normal uh, thing back then. But anyway, this stone is on a type of schist. Now, this schist was sourced out of Pomfret or. Pomfret, Thompson, one of those surrounding areas. And you notice how it has almost a brown hue. That's because this particular type of schist has a large amount of iron ore in it. And you can see a lot of that in most of his work. He probably owned his own quarry, but we have no probate evidence as to that of yet. But he was a relatively popular carver. Like I mentioned, over almost 50 stones in Sabin. There is another 60 stones in Old Abington. There's large numbers of his stones in East Hampton in Brooklyn, there's some in Killingly, there's some in Thompson, a fair amount in Woodstock, a couple across the mass border, there's some as far south as Griswold, Plainfield, and Norwich even. But his designs, again, considerably unique, and there's not a lot of obvious attributions that you could make out of it, because he was carving this style of stone in, uh, by the mid-1750s, his design was pretty standardized. These are a few examples of his work that I thought were worth mentioning. The first one here is actually an Oak Street burying ground in Norwich, and uh, it's a very early example of his work when he was just starting out. How it got to Norwich and how he was already known of, he probably knew someone who died in Norwich, as Ruthie had mentioned, reverse genealogy. You can see the more primitive nature of this stone, but compare that to this stone for a husband and wife. You have the two cherubim, heavy jawed cherubim, and you'll notice you have an attempt at showing feathers, but an abstract folk art attempt. On this stone, again, iron ore content. It's very brown. Here's another two stones by uh, Kimball. Another attempt at your feathering on this stone here. Look, if you look at the borders of the stone, you see grapevine borders. You see a lot of kind of what you might call filler. I would call this filler. Basically, these are just abstract designs. And do they have any real meaning? I don't know. But they do, but they add to the aesthetic value of the stone. Some carvers, they may have actually had a meaning for these, others just copied these designs just because it looked pretty. Another example of the vine borders. He also was odd because he used a lot of square shaped stones, which did not really become popular until later in the marble era. But again, you can see this, the heavy jaws and in this case, more upslope wings, but again, attempts at scaling these wings. I really would call it more like fish scales. Now, I'm going to get into the Mannings, who we were just talking about, but they were the by far the most prominent carvers of their era. Uh, they carved from uh, 1760, starting with the father, Josiah Manning, who began carving about 1760, carved until his death in 1806, carved his own grave, signed it, and that's over in the old Wyndham Cemetery. But he was the first of the Manning Carvers, and one could say the most prominent of such, because he was the man who largely came up with the designs. When he had his two sons who worked with him, Frederick and Rockwell, both of them largely copied uh, their father's designs. Though that's not to say they weren't somewhat creative in their own length. Some of their stones are quite beautiful and elaborate themselves. But they all somewhat revolve around this style of cherubim. You have the round bug eyes, as I would call them, you have this heavy-lipped jaw here, and then you have, again, the pompadour and the wig. You have a somewhat of an upswept wing, usually some clouds up here. This stone is made of Bolton schist, and it's aged quite beautifully. Bolton schist, of course, quarried out of Bolton, was the main source of schist that was used by grave carvers in eastern Connecticut from when the, the quarries opened up in the early 1750s until much later. But he began carving, was this very talented stone cutter, and a lot of his, even his very early work, you can 
find some of it in Woodstock, in Sturbridge. But his, again, his sons he taught, his sons ended up both buying a shop in Norwich. The partnership did not last. Frederick ended up staying in Norwich and continuing on the family business. Rockwell moved up to, I believe, Canterbury, continued carving by himself. But they carved, the total family carved uh, over 2,000 stones. Stones found uh, in Heartland, Connecticut to, uh, to some extent, but mostly common from, there's, there's a large number of them in Hartford, there's a couple in West Hartford, but mostly in Wyndham, New London, and some of Tolland County. There's a few examples as far south as King Street, South Carolina, and Wilmington, North Carolina, a couple in Rhode Island, and of course a, a large number of them in the mass border towns of Woodstock. In fact, uh, Bungay Hill Cemetery in Woodstock has over 106 stones by the Mannings. And that's a fair amount of way. That was like a four-hour carriage ride back then to bring all those stones. Think about that. A couple more examples of Manning's work. Here's another very elaborate stone. That's over in Scotland, Connecticut. Very elaborate borders. You can see no wings on this one. Same style of head. We have these large flowers. It was all dictated by what the customer wanted. The customer had more money. He would oftentimes not only request a larger, more elaborate stone, but he would request specific designs. This is one of the largest monuments by Manning. That, that stone weighs over, over a thousand pounds. Here's a relatively more conventional stone. However, this person still likely had some money. You paid by the, what, the letter. And so well, you have a stone with a lot of words. Bible verses, a lot of different family members mentioning the in-laws. This is over in Mansfield. And again, you still, on a, on a somewhat of a simpler stone, you still have that level of craftsmanship. This, 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 this design here, it took a lot of skill to carve. Again, you had to carve all this out. Carve all this out. That alone was a week, just for this top part here. And that's not, I'm not talking about the actual design here, I'm talking about just carving out the initial shapes. With the success of the Mannings came a lot of people who imitated their styles. I mentioned Levius Kimball. Despite having his own father as a guide, he largely conformed to the style. And there were a number of others, some of which are present besides Levius Kimball, in uh, Sabin. This stone here was carved by a fellow of Bolton, Connecticut, named Aaron Haskin. Now, Haskins was a carver who started out in the early 1770s, and he actually imitated several people, but most of his work was the Mannings. This is by Haskins. You can see the similarities in that. But again, Bolton Schist, aged quite well, still took skill to carve this. So that's not negating his skill, but he was not exactly the the most innovative in terms of his design work. Now the next carver I'll get into here is Elijah Sykes, who was not a Connecticut native, but is heavily represented in Sabin. Sykes was a Massachusetts carver who actually had a father and, I believe, a brother who also carved. So he was a part of a carving family. You'll notice a trend. A lot of these people have families that are into this, or they will start a family trend. And uh, Ruthie had mentioned the Stancliffs. The Stancliffs had five generations of carvers, starting with James Stancliffe, who began carving in about 1686. He carved headstones and tables, but it would go on to, he had a brother, and then he had a son, and his son had a son, and etc., etc. and I believe the last one of them died around 1820, and they were all carving until the end. But Sykes was a Massachusetts carver who worked from around 1760 to his death in 1798. Sykes learned a trade from his father, Joseph, and was carving stones all over the central eastern mass, so like your Worcester County, your uh, Hanover County, those types of areas. And a lot of his stones spread into uh, eastern Connecticut. A lot of his stones present not only in Sabin, but in the, the nearby burying ground uh, in Aspinall, which is of course in Putnam, the other Pomfret, which is uh, the other graveyard Pomfret, you also have some in Brooklyn. You have some as south as Plainfield, Griswold, uh, Woodstock, etc., etc. So despite being from Massachusetts, his work was quite popular. Now, I see some trends in his design, like these vines, that are similar to the types of trends that are present in the works of Kimball. I call this style here your central eastern Massachusetts ornamental style, where it's distinctly different from the styles used by the Mannings of their eastern Connecticut carvers. You have vines going all around, but then it spreads into just grapes. And is the wing, I'm sorry, the face, you'll notice, has no wings. Instead, you have two rosettes. Sykes almost never used wings. That's one interesting tenet of his stones. But Sykes' designs uh, 
well, unique, uh, besides the family, have been unable to attribute where they came from. However, he himself had imitators. Again, when you have a guy who has a design, and you see his stones of his design, you're probably going to be like, if I want to sell stones, I should try to copy a guy, or at least take elements of his design, and it works. These are just two more examples of Sykes' work. The first one here is actually in Sabin. This is a double stone. This uh, stone here is on a similar stone to what uh, Kimball worked on, where it has a lot of iron oxide in it. Unlike a lot of carvers who worked chiefly on one material, he worked on a variety, including slate, several different types of schist, including, like I said, this is another type of schist. This is uh, more similar to a Bolton schist, but it was not from Bolton. Probably carved in Hanover or Worcester County. White stone, there's a few stones he carved on marble, uh, black slate. So, unlike most carvers, he worked on a variety of materials. But again, look at these designs here. You don't really see that anywhere else. Very skilled carver. You have these different types of flower rosettes. There's an hourglass, which is, of course, your time's up. That's what that's telling me. And a lot of different abstract shapes. This is not in a standard grade material. So again, customer dictates. Uh, Basis Sewell, one of the Sewells who you'll see represented here is Basis Sewell who was actually a carver from uh, Middleborough, Mass. And, uh, well, originally he grew up in uh, eastern Massachusetts, learned from his father. Uh, six of his members of his family were carvers, but he moved from Middleborough to Brooklyn, Connecticut, and continued carving. Instead of uh, tr uh, moving over to local materials like forms of schist or uh, other material, he continued outsourcing slate, because that's what he was used to working. If you look at his work, he doesn't carve very deep. The slate usually is a very reliable material for aging, so you don't need to carve that deep for it to age well. This is a better quality of slate, probably from Worcester, Massachusetts region. The, the cherubs he used were more stern than a lot of others I've seen. I believe they represent the looks of like a, almost like a military face, because they're stern, they're not really cheerful, continues on and, and dwindles after the age of the Great Awakening, which took place from the 1740s onward. You have less skulls in Massachusetts, and you have less uh, scornful looking faces. You start seeing more design work. It's not seen as much as a vanity thing or an idolatry thing. It just becomes a form of art, I suppose you could say. But his faces remain somewhat stern. Like I mentioned, they remind me of that of like a painting of a soldier standing with his rifle or something. Relatively popular in Wyndham, living in Brooklyn. Uh, a lot of his stones are in Brooklyn, Woodstock. There's stones in, uh, of course, Sabin, as well as the other pump and bearing ground in Abington, and other towns as well. He ended up moving to Chaplin later on and had conformed to the urn and willow design and died there, buried under an undistinguished marble slab. The David Lambs came from Norwich, and they started with the father, who carved from about 1750 until his death in 1773. His son, of course, learned from his father, but the designs were somewhat different, but generally there were a lot of similarities. And unlike a lot of carvers in that region who would have used a form of schist, whether from Bolton or local, they found an odd source of almost like a very fine sandstone. It's not really a sandstone, but it's very similar in quality to a, like a very fine sandstone. Originally, the stone actually would have been gray when quarried. In general, his stones age well, but I'd say one out of ten have aged horribly, and it's very odd because you'll have some stones like that one where the uh, imagery is very fine, and then others where the entire front is shelled off. So a lot of variation in whatever this unknown material was. Stones common throughout most of New London County, though again, stones in Pomfret, some in Hampton, some in Thompson even. But majority of his work was near the coast, Groton, Norwich, Preston, etc. One cannot deny the craftsmanship, the relief given to this stone, and, and underneath that's slate, all this, isn't it? underneath, yes, this is a black it's slate, like the most desirable big. slate, or one of the most desirable, I should say. But as you can see, underneath all of this lichen, the imagery will be crisp and pure. It won't have, it won't really have weathered.